It's sure nice to have you back here together with us here at Tamiami Village Church. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be multiplied to you all. It's been a great summer. Uh, I hope you've had a great summer, whether you've been down here um, uh, weathering the hot weather in Florida or been somewhere else up north like Michigan or Ohio or wherever. And uh, we're glad to have you here together with us today. Uh, just a few announcements as we begin. Um, I talked to, is it Helen Riley? Is that her name, Helen Riley? Yes. Yes. Uh, Helen Riley said that uh, supposedly uh, Friendship Hall is supposed to get some roof repair. There's, there's issues with the Mansard roof, which is the type of roof it has. And it was supposed to have been done during the summer, but obviously it didn't get done. So there's going to be a rush, I'm sure. But so for the time being, uh, we're going to be meeting here, Lord willing, every Sunday. And hopefully soon we'll be able to meet back over at Friendship. But right now we're at Flamingo. And by the way, I had this conversation with Larry this morning. See behind me it says Flamingo Hall. But you know what it says outside, out there? It says Flamingo Star Hall. So which one is it? Well, you make a star. <laughs> All right. Um, secondly, uh, all of you know that our church services are available online, and Tom mentioned this morning that he had been following us. If you go uh, on YouTube and put in Larry Hagerman, you'll find it usually in Sunday, at Sunday afternoon sometime, because Larry prints it or publishes about that time. And we're glad for everybody that does that. Um, we also have, are they out? Oh, they're in the back. We have boxes for what's called Operation Christmas Child. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about when I say Operation Christmas Child? Okay, <laughs> Operation Christmas Child is uh, the ministry of Samaritan's Purse to children throughout the world. And uh, we can take uh, an, a box and fill it with all kinds of great toys for children. And then it gets sent to Operation Christmas or to Samaritan's Purse and they distribute it throughout the world. And uh, you can even track where it goes into the children to, to whom it goes to. So uh, we're going to be doing that. Um, I have two options for you. If you want to take, there are actual boxes back there uh, on the counter in the back of the church there. And if you want to take one, you can do that. There are other people that say, I'm not really able to go and shopping and fill it out. I can't imagine not having fun filling out a box. But you know, if you can't do that, you can just give an offering and that money can go to someone else who does the joy of shopping and putting it together, okay? Just as a little challenge to you, uh, you know that I also serve Windmill Village, and Windmill Village did it last year, and they decided as a church that they were going to do 100 boxes. 100 boxes. So, a um, little challenge thrown out there to Tamiami Village Church, okay. Any other announcements that need to be made this morning? Yes. Gideon will furnish you an individual per per personal worker's testament for all the boxes. Sweet. Sweet. So we, have, we have a New Testament for each of the boxes uh, from Gideon's. Praise God. Okay. Any other announcements? All right. One of the things that happens over the summer and that is that life goes on and we have uh, friends who uh, have passed on from when we were last together. And we just heard news yesterday that Dorothy Thomas, that is Chris Cooey's mother, uh, died yesterday. She was 98 years old. So uh, are there any other people that we need to know that had died in this last, during the summer? Not that we know, but plenty still to pray for, okay? We'll mention that a little bit later. We have prayer requests on the back of the bulletin. All right. Well, then let's turn our hearts to the Lord. And if you have your bulletin there, you can look with me as I read this opening scripture taken from Psalm 29. It says this, Give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. 
worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we come before you in the name of Jesus, and we're thankful today for the privilege of being together. We thank you, Lord God, for all of our friends that are here this morning. We're thankful that uh, you have given them safety and brought them through the summer. And now as the fall season has begun and we begin services here again at Tamiami, we just pray, Lord God, that you would be with us and that you would minister to us by your Holy Spirit. Speak to us through your word. And I pray, Lord God, that as we are together, that we would truly adore and worship you. And that at the same time, Lord, you would come and minister to our hearts, that we might go from here uh, encouraged, uh, having encountered God, and strengthened to walk with you in the light of your word every day. Bless this time together now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we begin, just note that today is the first Sunday we're back together. It is also the first Sunday of the month. And that means that it's our tradition to have communion. So we will be serving communion here later in the service. If you have a hymnal, I invite you to turn with me to number 163. Number 163, our first hymn is entitled, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Number 163. And if you are able to stand, let's stand together and sing the three verses of this song. Thank you. You may be seated. In the back of the bulletin there on page 616, it's number 638, we're going to read from Psalm 84. Psalm 84. Did that just come on? Could you hear me? Can you hear me better? All of a sudden I feel like I'm overpowered by my own voice here. Uh, psalm 84 is a great psalm about going to church about being in God's tabernacle, uh, the courts of the Lord. In fact, as the writer writes this psalm, he writes about even the birds have a place they like, and it's God's house. So notice as we read this, this is Psalm 84, number 638. Uh, I will read the, the bold print, and you can respond together in the fine print. How amiable are thy tabernacles, my soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found a house. And the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even thine altars, O Lord of hosts. My King and thy God. 
Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will see the praise Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee. And whose heart are the ways of them. Who passing through the valley of Baca make it a well. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Behold, O God, our shield. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will be told from men that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. God bless the reading of his word. Praise God. All right, if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn with me uh, to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 14, Exodus chapter 14. Uh, I do a, a, a seminar, I haven't done it for several years, it's a walk through the Old Testament seminar, and you learn hand motions about what happens in the Old Testament. And uh, uh, what happens is God sends this guy named Moses, and he says to Pharaoh, let my people go, and Pharaoh says, no. So God has to send 10 plagues and then the Passover. And the next thing we do is called the Red Sea. The Red Sea. And this story is about the Red Sea. Now, just as kind of a note, how many of you have heard the story of the Red Sea before? Raise your hand. Okay, a few of you, like everyone. <laughs> so this isn't a new story to us, but let's consider it as it applies to us in the 21st century. My sermon title is, in, is God Will Make a Way. Amen. God Will Make a Way. So if you want to follow along with me, there is an outline on the back of the bulletin there. And if you want to follow along, uh, you can do that with me. So let's pray together. And I'm not going to read the text specifically at the beginning, but we're going to reference the text as we go through. Okay, so let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word today. And we pray, Lord God, as we consider uh, this historical account of the children of Israel being saved by God through the waters of the Red Sea and how you drowned the Egyptians, we pray, Lord God, that you would cause us to once again see that you are interested in us and, Lord, you will make a way. Bless this word then to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So if you have your outline, I was going to tell this story. There's a story of a guy who, who worked a triple, triple, double. He had three days in a row where he did like a double shift. And he was working at this hotel. And uh, he was so tired afterwards, he ordered dinner, sat down, and his head was kind of still in a fog. And as he started to pray, he said... Good evening, Holiday Inn, how can I help you? <laughs> All right, so let's read the text. Uh, Exodus chapter 14, beginning with verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before pi Hahiroth, between Migdal and the sea, opposite Baal Zephon. You shall camp before it, by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered in the land, the wilderness has closed them in, and then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. All right, so here we go. Uh, if you want to follow along the outline, and that is, first of all, I want to say this, that God led his people in the past. If you study the history of the book of Exodus, we know the children of Israel, that they were in slavery for, anybody remember how many years they were in slavery? 400 years. 
The end of the book of Genesis, it's uh, Joseph, and he's in charge of, he's the prime minister of Egypt. But the, by the time Exodus starts, it's 400 years of slavery for the children of Israel. But God led, uh, led them, and he raised up a leader, and that was Moses. That Moses, that Moses was the one that led them out of slavery in Egypt. In fact, what we have is, uh, we have this miraculous thing called the Ten Plagues. And God did these ten plagues, and the final of the plagues was the death of the firstborn in Egypt. And the way the children of Israel were delivered from having their firstborn also be killed is God had them kill a lamb. A lamb was slain, and the blood was put over the doorpost of the house. And we have a beautiful picture of how God saves us. He delivers us from sin by the blood of the Lamb, that is Jesus Christ. And so God has always led the children of Israel in the past, and now he's leading them to another place. And if you read this text, many of the Bible scholars say God led them. He didn't lead them by the way, of the, uh, the, the, the way they would normally go, because the children of Israel might walk by the sea. They went a, a, a south route by the wilderness. And God specifically sent them that way, uh, he, God told them where to go, and he knew the top, topography of the land. He knew how difficult this was. And if we think about it, where they were led, they were led like, I would call it like a, a mountain pass. And they went through the bottom part of this mountain in the valley, and they came to a place where, where the, water, the water has a big sandy beach, and they're on this sandy beach. But there's only one way that they came in, and there's no way out. And God had them go that way. It seems like God was kind of sending them to a specific place, and he did it so that Pharaoh might think that they were confused. <laughs> in fact, the Lord says to, to Moses there in verse uh, two, 3, for Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. You know what they say about men when they're lost? That they never ask directions? You ever heard that before? Oh, yeah. Praise God for something called GPS, right? <laughs> in fact, my children live in, uh, live in Texas, and anytime they go anywhere, it's a huge town. It's Dallas, Fort Worth. Anytime they're going anywhere, they turn on their GPS. We do too, don't we? Because <laughs> we don't know our way around. And that's what Pharaoh thought about the children of Israel. They're confused. Isn't that what it said? It doesn't use the word. It says, uh, he said, they are bewildered by the land. That kind of sounds like they're lost, doesn't it? <laughs> the wilderness has closed them in. And so God put in Pharaoh's mind, by the way he led his children, he, that Pharaoh thinks they don't know where they're going. And God said, Pharaoh will pursue them. And then I'm going to overthrow Pharaoh so that I will get the glory. Right? God says, uh, the, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. And so what happens here? He knew the heart of Pharaoh. In the back, the scripture even says he hardened. God said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And so what happened? God had a plan. God had a plan. Let's see what happens. Verse 5. Now, it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people, and they said, why have we done this? What have we, why have we let Israel go from serving us? They served us for 400 years. Why did we let them go? Well, automatically I can think of 10 reasons why they should have let them go. You know what they're called? <laughs> the plagues. But he changed his mind. Why did we let them go? So go on. He said, uh, verse 6, So he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Now that doesn't just mean his chariot. But that means his whole army. Verse six, uh, verse seven says, he also took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. You see, 
we think about uh, military might and we think about technology today and all the nice things we have if we want to go to war. But back then, the most sophisticated army and the most sophisticated uh, equipment was a chariot. And he had 600 choice chariots. Now, we think it might have just been 600 chariots, but I was reading that Josephus, the great historian, the one that wrote about the time of Jesus, he also wrote about earlier times in, the, in uh, the children of Israel. And so Josephus writes that Pharaoh took 50,000 horsemen and 200,000 footmen, and they were all, all armed. So it wasn't just the chariots. It was this huge army that went after the children of Israel. Now remember I said, where are they? In the topography of the land, they walk through this valley and they're kind of like on this sandy beach. And on the other side of the beach, obviously, is what? Water. So really, there's only one way into the place where they're at. And there's no other way out. And what's happening now in the story? What is happening in the story? Well, I put under three, Pharaoh and his army were on one side, and the people of God saw there was no way out. So let's read the story. Verse 8. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and the chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them, camping by the sea beside Pihahiroth, before Beth Ziphon, Baal Ziphon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the, the Egyptians marched, at, marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Now, I'm not sure what you would be like, but here it is. There's only one way in and no way out, and who's in the way in? <laughs> it's the bad guy. Exactly, Tom. It's the bad guys. And it's not just one bad guy. It's this huge army. And the Bible says about the children of Israel that they were very afraid. Would you be afraid? <laughs> now, remember, the children of Israel, they're not armed. They just went out of Egypt. They, they had spoiled Egypt with all the, the things they had taken from and been given by the Egyptian people. But they didn't go out with armor. So what happens? They cried out to God. Now, there's something else about this. It says in verse 11, then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness? Now, when I read that text, I go, are they crazy? Are they crazy? They had spent 400 years in, the, in, in Egypt. They had been slaves in Egypt. And now God delivers them, and they go, well, you brought us out here to die? You know what that says to me? That says to me that, you know, it's interesting. When we get in difficult times, I think kind of stupid stuff comes out of our mouth. We can say, honestly, the stupidest things when we're in trouble. Like, I wish it would have never been this way. Why did I ever do this? It would have been better, just like the children of Israel said, it would have been better, right, fill in the blank, if this wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have been better, are you kidding? If they'd gone back to Egypt, the Egyptians had just had their firstborn killed, would they have accepted them with open arms? Are you kidding? <laughs> it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. And so they cry out to God, but then they also complain. Anybody, can anybody relate to that? Trouble comes and we complain. Sometimes we lose our faith. Sometimes we lose our faith, that's for sure. Okay, so, so here's what happened. Here's what happened. They had cried out to God. 
And then Moses responds, verse 13, and, and Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you will hold your peace. That's what Moses said. Moses, like you talked about, Joyce, Moses spoke a word of faith in the middle of their fear. And he said, stand still and see the salvation of God. God will fight for you. Now, I'm not sure if Moses knew exactly what was going to happen. He was just going to follow the Lord's leading, but he knew that God was on his side and he had faith that God would do something. And so what happened? Uh, it says in verse 15, and the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people to go forward. Wait a minute, go forward? That seems counterproductive. Go forward. There's water on this side. How are we going to go forward? Have you ever noticed that when God speaks, oftentimes it's counterintuitive. God asks us to do something, we go like, that doesn't make sense. And yet God asks us to do it. And here the children of Israel are told by God, or God tells Moses to tell the children of Israel, go forward. Well, how are they going to go forward? On this side are the Egyptians and they're going to take them, overtake them. And on this side, there's water. Let's read on. Verse 16, but now lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry, land, dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I will indeed harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and all of his army and his chariots and the horse, his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh and his chariots and his horsemen. See, God had a plan. The children of Israel didn't know the plan, but God knew exactly what he was doing. In my outline, I said this, that God, uh, this is C, God moved between them to protect Israel. It says in verse 19, the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved in and went behind them, and the pillar of fire, uh, cloud went before them, went from before them and stood behind them. And so it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud of, and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. So it's the middle of the night, and here's the pillar of cloud, and the children of Israel are here on the sandy beach, and the Egyptians are here, and the cloud comes between them, and it's dark for the Egyptians, but it's light. For the Israelites. You know what the Bible says about the message of the cross? It says in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, the message of the cross is foolish. It's foolishness to them that perish. But to those, who are be, those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And when I see that picture, I see the picture here. It's a picture of the children of Israel are protected by this cloud, but the Egyptians don't understand it. It's darkness to them. But to the children of Israel, it's light. And God protects them. And all through the night, then God sends an east wind. You know what happens? It blows the water. It blows the water. And all of a sudden, the water is now gone. And all that's there, it's probably, it's, there's, it's banked on both sides. But here it is in the middle, it's dry land. Certainly you've seen the movie Ten Commandments, right? You've seen that scene where they show them walking through the water as on dry land. It's interesting to note here, if you have your, your bulletin, would you look at the front of your bulletin there? Did anybody know what that is? This looks like a big pillar here, doesn't it? Uh, Ron Wyatt in 1978 found this pillar on either side of a place called Nueva Beach. 
And on it was an inscription. And the inscription was actually put there by a man named Solomon. That Solomon put a, one of these on each side of the beach to commemorate the crossing of the Red Sea. Now, there's been a debate, and there still is debate today as to where it was, but, you know, it's kind of like physical evidence. Here's an actual marker that says this is where it happened. So the children, and it's interesting to note, when they, when they study that beach, on either side of that beach, the water is very deep. It's like 2,500 feet. But there's a place where, in the middle, there's a place where it's like an underground bridge where the water is only so deep. And when God blew the water away, here where the bridge was opened up so they could walk on dry land. A mile this way or a mile that way, they would have been 2,500 feet down or underwater. But there was a beach. You see, back to my outline, God opened up the sea for them to cross. They didn't see it, but God knew it. God had a plan, and he made a way for them. And you know what? I, as I think about this story, I think about the way it is for us. I think about the fact that oftentimes we get in a situation, and God even allows us in a situation, where it seems to us this is an impossible situation. We've got an enemy on this side, and there is no way out. And God might say to us, that's no big deal to me. Do you trust me? Do you believe that I'll make a way? And so the Bible says, and let's read it. Verse 21, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the, the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry land, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued them and went after them into the midst of the sea, all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. So if the children of Israel can go, they'll go too. And that's what they did. They went through the water. Letter E in my outline says, Pharaoh and his army followed. See what happens. Of course, we know what happens, don't we? <laughs> Let's read on. Verse 24, Now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of the of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians, and he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. It's interesting to note, they went in that same place where I talked about this beach. And you know what they found when they went underground and went under the water? They found things that looked an awful lot like a chariot wheel. There's pictures you can see. Obviously, there's coral that's grown on them, but it, you look at it, you go, it looks an awful lot like a chariot wheel to me. Um, verse 25, And he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove with difficulty, and the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of the Lord, the face of Israel, for the Lord fights against them. I'm sorry, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. All right, so what happens? Well, we know what happens. The Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Now, I've heard stories before people said, this really wasn't a miracle. You know, it really wasn't a miracle. There's a place where the water's only a, just a few feet deep, and, and maybe the wind blew a bit, but maybe they were able to walk through. They were able to walk through just, you know, knee deep of water. And some pastor was telling this story, and a kid said, that really is a miracle then. 
And the pastor goes, no, no, that wasn't a miracle. Yes, it was. What do you mean, young man? He said, well, it's amazing that the army of the Egyptians drowned in only three feet of water. No, they drown. They all drown. And God won the victory. So what happened here? Letter G. The people feared and believed the Lord. Let's read what happened. Uh, verse 26. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that had come in the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. But the children of Israel had walked on the dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared God, feared the Lord, and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. You see, God had a plan. The children of Israel didn't know it. They thought they were, in, they were like dead meat. But God made a way through the Red Sea. And his way through the Red Sea was salvation for them, and it was destruction for their enemies. And in the end, God won the victory, and God was glorified through all this. And the children of Israel, it says, they feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord. So what about you today? Well, first of all, let me say this. There is an analogy here there is an analogy that is that God has always been one who has made a way. When we get to the New Testament, my friends, you know what happens? In the New Testament, God sent his only begotten son into the world because we had sinned against him. And the wages of sin, the Bible says, was death. But God was going to make a way that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There was no way that we could save ourselves. In fact, the Bible says we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And there is no way that we can save ourselves. And there is only one way, and God made a way. And the way is through his son, Jesus Christ. And the picture here is, the only way that we make it to God, the only way that we are able to make it to heaven is we need to walk through on dry land. That the sea is parted. And you know how the sea was parted? By the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died for us so that he could make a way for us. In fact, Jesus said of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So have you found the way to Jesus Christ? Have you found the way to God through Jesus Christ? This was a physical salvation. This was physical salvation for the children of Israel. They were physically saved from being destroyed. And God oftentimes can do that. He can give us physical salvation from something that we may face. But in a deeper sense, God gives us a spiritual salvation. That is something that we face spiritually that God delivers us from. So I ask you the question today. What situation do you find yourself in where you think there's no way out? Do you believe that God can make a way for you? God will make a way when there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. And he will make a way for you. Let's read our conclusion together. If you have your bulletins, it's right there in the end of my outline. Let's read it together. 
God leads us as his children into paths that seem impossible for us to navigate. He wants us to come to the end of ourselves and trust him in the midst of it. He will make a way out. His way will be amazing and he will get the glory. Amen. Let's pray together, can we? Father in heaven, thank you for this word to our hearts today. Thank you that God, you made a way for the children of Israel through the Red Sea. And Lord, we can trust you today to make a way for us in whatever we face. Help us to trust you today and to fear you just as the children of Israel did and to believe that you are the God, the God who will make a way. Amen. Amen. All right. We are going to move from the ministry of the word to our time together at the Lord's table. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians 11 that a man or a woman ought to examine himself or herself before they partake of the bread and drink of the cup. And so I think we need to just spend a few moments in self-examination, asking God to, to basically cleanse our hearts and to make us ready to receive today. So let's just spend a few moments before the Lord in self-examination. Let's pray together the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And let's state our faith as it is expressed in the Apostles' Creed. You may know this by heart. If you don't, it's listed there in the bold. Let's say it. Let's state it together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, when he had supped, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this cup is the New Testament, or New Covenant, in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a communion in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not a communion in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake, for we all partake of the one bread. For as often as you Take this bread and drink this cup. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're going to pass out the elements, and then we will hold them together and take them all at the same time. Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you.
Let's have a moment of silent prayer before the Lord. Our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ, who now has bestowed upon you his holy body and blood, whereby he has made full satisfaction for all your sins, strengthen you in true faith unto everlasting life. Amen. All right, is there anyone who would like to give a testimony this morning? A testimony of God's grace. Colleen. Oh, praise the Lord. Now, his, your son-in-law's name is what? Dave Kendall. Yeah, that's the one you'd gone up for the summer to help your daughter, right? Yeah. Praise God. Thank you for that testimony. Anyone else? Yes, Doris. Also, thank you all for prayers for DJ Duffy, my second cousin who was injured with that gunshot wound. He is improving so much. He now can see out of his eye. It's open more. He's smiling. He's saying a few words at a time now. He even sang a song one Sunday when I had the daughters. I get his daughters every Sunday afternoon to do something with them. And we went back, and his wife had taught him to sing, Welcome back, welcome back. And he sang it, and it was like, wow. So now and he's able to walk with just a crutch, a handheld crutch, and he's walking all around the house, doing, he even dressed himself yesterday for the first time, completely dressed himself. So he's improving so much. God is answering those prayers. So thank you all, and just keep praying. He's getting there. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah. He is in the bulletin. I, I forgot to erase the word in hospital, but he is still recovering from the gunshot wound. Yeah. Praise God. How is... Mr. Kanake. Uh, he's having some problems, but uh, he's taking the doctor on the weapon. He needs a shoulder replacement. He needs a shoulder replacement. Okay. All right. Any other testimonies or prayer requests? Chuck. Yeah, I had a blessing here uh, around the 4th of July. I saw on television that you get these shoes that you could slip on, you know. So I went and bought a pair oh, no. of these $95 slip-on shoes. And then the next morning, 5 o'clock in the morning, I go to take the garbage out. I put that shoe half on, and then I couldn't get any more on, so I reached down to get it, and I lost my balance. I did three hops and went over backwards like a big bumblebee, you know. And that landed right in the middle of the kitchen floor, splat. And, uh, I had been having, having terrible back pain before that, and I've been getting shots for years. But you know, the Lord used that flat me out in the back in the take care of my back. He actually, I have had no pain in my back since the accident, uh, my fall. So what I thought was bad, the Lord used for good. You know. <laughs> So we, we serve an amazing God, I'm telling you. No more shots in my back. You used to get like six shots at a time in order to function, and no problem. So it took a fall for your back to be okay, is that what you're saying? What's that? It took a fall for your back to be okay, is that what you're saying? Yes. Yes. It took a fall for your back to be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. God will make a way, huh? <laughs> That's right. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I don't have the back pain that I used to have. That's right. I don't have the shots that I used to have. God is an awesome God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I went to see Chuck a couple days after that happened, and he goes, God was like, he did like a divine chiropractic move. Is that right? <laughs> All right, anyone else? All right, 
it says in the bulletin, our tithes and offerings are lifted to God, and we do lift them to God. We have, for since COVID, we basically haven't passed out an offering plate, uh, but we do have a, a, a place for you to put your offerings today, and we're thankful to you, each of you, for your faithfulness in giving. So God bless you as you give. Let's sing a couple songs together, can we? Um, I think one of the things that's a blessing for communion is that we can be assured that our sins are forgiven. Jesus said, when, he gives, when, we, when we take the, the wine, this is my blood of the covenant, which was shed for you. In the Old Testament, they always had to, there was always the shedding of blood. And the shedding of Jesus' blood is our new covenant. We are assured, my friends, that our sins are forgiven. Amen. All right, so blessed assurance, number 299. Do you guys know this song? How many guys know this song? Pretty much, okay, so I want to have you play through it now. Go ahead, let's just sing it. Let's also sing number 369. Emmeline, would you play through this one time so we know the tune? There's two different tunes to this song, so. stand up, right? <laughs> so let's stand and sing this song. <laughs>
We're going to turn together in prayer. Were there any other requests that uh, need to be mentioned today? Uh, we, we have in the, uh, the list there to pray for Woody Woodward. That's uh, Beth's brother-in-law, my brother-in-law. And he has begun taking chemotherapy again. He has two weeks on and one week off. And um, this last week he didn't take it because he wasn't strong enough. But he's trying to work again. So we want to continue to pray for him. Beth? Um, also, I didn't tell you this, but my mom had an appointment. She never, we prayed for her for those two, they put in two valves. Um, one or both are leaking a little bit, but I don't think they're going to do anything about it, but she's in permanent arrhythmia now. So. Okay. But anyway, she keeps going. My brother visited from England in August, and they stayed with her for three years. Quite a long time, yeah. yeah so. <clears throat> also, I was on the phone with Pete and Elaine Longjohn. Um, Elaine is doing a little bit better. Pete says that she's able to write on a whiteboard. She can say a few words, and she can write on a whiteboard. So she actually has ability to communicate. So that was kind of an encouragement to hear. But well, we'll continue to pray for them as well. Anyone else? Let's turn to God in prayer then, can we? Father in heaven, we come before you in Jesus' name, and we're thankful today that you are a God who makes a way for us. And Lord, there are so many times if we are honest with our life, we recognize that you were there all along, even though it seemed like we were alone or sometimes we weren't sure what you were doing. We know, God, that you were there working for us, and we know we can trust what you have done in the past that what you have done in the past, you will do in the future, that you are a God who will always be there, and that you will carry your work on to completion until the day of Christ. And so, Lord, I thank you for each person that has come today, and I pray, Lord God, that you would minister to their heart and their life as they go from here today. And, Lord, for these requests that we have heard, we want to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We want to pray for those in authority, the President and the Supreme Court and the Congress. We want to pray for our missionaries, Carlos and Lillian Calero. We're thankful for the ministry they have, and we pray your blessing over them in El Salvador. For these that we've prayed for in the past, we're thankful, Lord, for the testimony Colleen gave about her son-in-law, Dave, and we're thankful, God, that he has been able to go through this therapy and, Lord, that the cancer has been in remission. We're thankful for that, and we pray that may continue. We continue to pray for our dear sister, Elaine, Long John, and we pray your continued recovery for her from her stroke. For my brother-in-law, Woody, we pray you'd strengthen him for each day that he is, has God. I pray, Lord God, that you would give him uh, the ability to overcome this cancer, and I pray that, Lord, you would rid his body of it. We're thankful for the good report about D.J. Duffy, and we pray your continued uh, recovery for him as he is... Uh, done all these things in the last few weeks. We're thankful for the testimony of what you're doing in his life. For Bob Kinnick today, Lord, we pray for him as he goes in on the 11th here for another doctor appointment. But we pray, Lord God, for the issues that he is facing, especially as even as uh, Joyce said about a shoulder uh, surgery. We just pray, Lord God, that you administer to his heart and life. And for those who may be traveling, Lord, heading down to Florida in the next week, we pray, Lord, that you would give journeying mercies to them as well. For the requests that we may have on our hearts that we haven't spoken, the unspoken request, we pray, Lord God, that you would meet those needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So thank you that we can bring these requests before you, and we bring them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand together with me? Receive the benediction, and we will sing our doxology. 
Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.